Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast, The Value of Managed Pressure Drilling for Operators, Drilling Contractors, and the Industry. I'm Craig Fleming, Technical Editor of World Oil, and will be your moderator today. During this webcast, the presenters will discuss the commercial and financial benefits available to operators and drilling contractors via managed pressure drilling. The program will assess the underlying technical benefits and hazard mitigation MPD brings to every drilling operation. We'll look at actual results from land and offshore operations from around the world and consider how new technologies are changing the commercial drilling landscape at an unprecedented pace, along with their impact on tendering and rig rates. MPD brings significant financial benefits to operators more often than drilling engineers realize primarily because of its historically limited use and lack of training. But make no mistake, in today's market conditions, MPD is the tool to answer drilling contractors' immediate need to commercialize their investment. Before we get started, let's review some general housekeeping notes. Following the presentation, we'll have a short question and answer session. You can participate in the Q&A session by asking questions at any time during the presentation. Just type your question in the Q&A box located on the bottom left corner of your screen, then click the Submit button. You may enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking on the box button on the top right corner of the slide area. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. If you are experiencing problems with the program, please press F5 on your keyboard to refresh the presentation. You can also visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help button below the slide window. Now joining us for today's webcast are Anthony Spindler, Vice President of Managed Pressure Drilling, and Harshad Patel, Global Technical Manager, MPD Engineering Services from Weatherford. We'll turn this over to the technical experts and let them proceed with the presentation. Anthony? Hello, everyone. Thank you, World Oil, for this opportunity to have this webcast, and we appreciate everyone joining to hear about MPD today. And uh, managed pressure drilling is an incredible technology, and we look forward to sharing about it. You know, I have a lot larger background than, than that includes other industries, such as NASA and biotech. And it's these experiences using my professional credentials across the various products and services um, that has enabled me to see with fresh eyes the MPD technology, our market, and our industry. And it's interesting that over the course of time, I've heard so many contradictory points about MPD. In the same week, I could hear from one person MPD couldn't accomplish something while we had done that very thing for the same company somewhere else in the world. Hopefully our time today demystifies MPD and helps all of us understand its value. With that, I'll let Harshad introduce himself. Thank you, Anthony. <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. This is Harshad Patil. I started my career as a drilling engineer, designing and executing some complex extended reach wells offshore West Africa, which were essentially drilled without MPD. I continued as a drilling engineer for some years doing conventional offshore drilling before I moved to MPD around nine years ago. In my early career with MPD, I did start with learning how to hammer union, which was a criteria to becoming a well site supervisor, and worked extensively in the field operating MPD equipment. Since then, I have not only installed and executed numerous MPD jobs globally, but worked on accomplishing several engineering calculations related to MPD cementing, well displacements, running completions with MPD, influx management envelope, functional design specification with deep water MPD installations and the like, so from this experience, I plan to convey to you the difference MPD makes over conventional drilling from a selection of published papers. With that, let me hand it over to Anthony to kickstart our presentation. In talking today about managed pressure drilling, we're going to divide it into some sections. So the first part is technical, and uh, Harsha will go over some, some specific examples, uh, which also document in, public, in published papers, and we'll cover the value that bring, this brings to operators and drilling contractors. I'll also do some thumbnail cost-benefit analysis so we can see that together. And then I'll cover some industry trends and considerations as we think about technology and how it applies in our industry and how we should go forward. And then we'll open up for questions. Let's start with kind of reviewing what the registration questions were. So the first question was, do you know how much money you saved last time you used MPD? 
Um, 18 said yes, so, so uh, some percentage, but even more said no, they're not sure. What's kind of funny is more typed their address, so I don't know if that means we have a lot of job seekers who are used to typing their address in monster.com, but, but uh, maybe we didn't answer that question very well. Now, the second question was, how effectively have you commercialized? So 32% said yes, so that's a pretty good percentage and um, shows that, that many more, probably a good portion, do understand the value of MPD. And then the last question is we kind of broke, asked, what really risk are you concerned about? And you can see the responses there. Uh, quite a number of those hazards at the top, all are pressure-related hazards, which Harsh will talk about. But what's interesting is at the bottom, not very many said narrow window, which really isn't the use of MP today. It's really a risk mitigator. And even on the bottom, the two lowest are actually results of all the above. That NPT, you'll see that all those items above cause NPT and poor rate of penetration. We'll see those improvements in Harsh as examples. You know, we had almost th we had 375 people registered on Tuesday and almost 500 by today. And uh, I think these stats show, again, a good picture of what we think of NPD and what we know, and we look forward to sharing, sharing this information with you. With that, I'll turn it over to Harshad for the technical section. Thank you, Anthony. <clears throat> well, I'll be going over the examples to illustrate how NPD assists in mitigating these challenges. But first, we'd like to focus our attention on some industry statistics. Statistical data on non-productive time, like the Dodson data I'm referring to in the slide, shows you know, even more than 40% of NPT is caused by pressure-related events. These events include kicks and losses in stuck pipe or stuck pipe and twist-offs caused by wellbore collapse. Speaking with a few operators recently, they think that this NPD number could be as high as 50%. Now, this, is, this really affects our time and cost estimates to get a well down, don't they? But more importantly, all these events really increase the risk associated with safety. If you look at the well plans today, they're focused mainly on increasing the safety by mitigating or avoiding these drilling challenges. But in many cases, even with our best efforts, we end up exceeding our budgets and AFEs and experience a lot of downtime while facing some really challenging drilling complexities. There are two, there are two actual questions we'd like to discuss during this presentation. First is, does managed pressure drilling really help mitigate or resolve? One second there. Oh, there you go. All right. So two questions that, that we'd like to really discuss in this presentation. Firstly, does MPD really help mitigate or resolve these pressure rate events? And secondly, does MPD really enhance the overall drilling performance? Let's dig a little deeper into what these non-productive events really are. Take kick, for example. All eyes on the driller, right? He has to confirm that he actually took a kick, looking at his pit gain, he has to pick up, space out, turn the rotation pumps down, and then shut in. And if he's using driller's method for well control operations, he has to circulate the kick out without fracturing the formation, and then pump heavy kill mud weight. And in all of this, if he encounters losses, the risk of stuck pipe comes into play. Now, if he really gets stuck, the chances of him coming out of it reduces drastically, and in many cases, he would end up sidetracking the well and losing his BHA. Now, if the drill string gets stuck due to wellbore collapse, for instance, the chances of losing the BHA also increase drastically, and the sidetrack can again become necessary. Well, if you really think about it, MPD could be a great tool to avoid these events. But to ensure we utilize MPD to its full potential, we do need an engineered solution or an engineered approach, which, could, which, which actually could be much more stronger or beneficial than an impulsive, unrehearsed approach. Further, if you look at the MPD systems today, they can instantly detect influxes, and some of them can automatically apply surface back pressures to suppress or stop formation flows entering the wellbore. This instant response is geared to keep the influx size as small as possible to help reduce the potential risks associated with the well control. And once the well is back in control and the influx circuit out of the well, MPD helps maintain the desired bottom hole pressure, avoiding losses and mitigating stuck pipe events. In cases with depleted formations, the drilling margins could become a challenge, mainly as the risk of hole collapse increases considerably. The MPD technology allows us to maintain bottom hole pressures in the green zone, as shown, if planned correctly. 
So let me further illustrate this by using some real life examples. Now this example not only proves that MPD technology assisted in mitigating major drilling challenges, but it helped them enhance the overall performance of the 10 whale campaign in Haynesville. The graph compares the time it took to drill the first six wells conventionally to the last four wells which they drilled using the MPD technology. Their biggest issue was deciphering ballooning versus a sustained influx where procedural safety became a priority. In addition to that, obtaining higher ROP in Hainesville was a big challenge for them. As you all are aware, high trip gas and background gas become a safety hazard, especially in areas with naturally fractured formations. In these, when the BHA is stripped and the well sits for a day or two, large amounts of gas can accumulate at the bottom of the hole, which could migrate, migrate up depending on its solubility and bottom hole conditions. As you can see here from the graph, MPD significantly improved their drilling performance. They manipulated the bottom hole pressure per their need while drilling, as they were constantly analyzing the various data feeds they were getting. Some drilling engineers and specialists call it listening to the well. Well, during drilling, they didn't exactly use a constant bottom hole pressure method, but a combination of pressures to mitigate and prevent ballooning, losses, and maintain background gas to a minimal. And to their surprise, they, they, just by reducing the bottom hole pressures, their ROP increased from a mere 15 to 20 feet an hour to 40 to 50 feet an hour. So digging a little deeper into why ROP might increase by reducing bottom hole pressures, I came across a study of increased penetration rates in transition zones to abnormal pressures as cited in SPE drilling textbook or our red book. The study states that increase in ROP in the transition zone is a result of two important factors. First one is, of course, the decrease in, differential, in the differential pressure across the bottom of the hole. And second one is attributed to decrease in rock strength caused by undercompaction. Well, in the case of Haynesville, reducing the bottom of pressure by 1.5 pounds per gallon surely more than doubled the ROP. Next, let's take a look at an example from Middle East. Their issues mainly revolved around stuck pipe events, losses, and kicks. The operator provided us with offset data of around 53 wells, which we analyzed, and we found that 30% of the wells experienced NPT due to stuck pipe events. Interesting. Whereas 26 of the wells, 26% of the wells experienced well control events, probably due to poor pressure uncertainty or kicks in relation to nearby injection wells. And 11% of the wells experience NPD due to losses. Well, by using MPD and managing bottom hole pressures, they could lower the overall differential by almost 21%, which completely mitigated stuck pipe events. Furthermore, the operator could now obtain 14 pressure points in the oil water contact, which were never achieved in this field before. In many cases, the reason pressure across the oil water contact are important, especially down dip, is to plan the injector wells appropriately for enhancing the production of the entire formation. The MPD packages nowadays are usually equipped with Coriolis flow meters, which enhance the early kick detection algorithm. In this well, while they were drilling through the port pressure ramp, the MPD system detected an influx and controlled it by adding 150 PSI back pressure. The well was brought under control in less than four minutes in this case, which prevented shutting the well in and drilling could resume with a new surface back pressure without increasing mud weight. They could completely mitigate losses while drilling with MPD. The challenges of drilling in high pressure, high temperature environments become much more severe as compared to drilling through normally pressured zones, don't they? This is a real example of an exploration well in a gas-rich area with formation pressures around 18.5 ppg at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. What happened was, when they were drilling their offset well, they got a high-pressure kick, and during well control operations, they lost nearly 1,100 barrels of kill weight mud. They somehow managed to cure the losses and control the well, but then found that their drill string was stuck, and eventually they had to sidetrack. All of this caused them 45 days of non-productive time, and their future with exploration prospect was surely in jeopardy. Well, they wanted to see how MPD could help, 
and to everyone's surprise, Empathy could save them 50 days to reach target depths and was able to eliminate almost all of their pressure-related non-productive non time. The reason MPD was successful in this well was because they could maintain their bottom hole pressure above the 18.5 formation pressures and could prevent losses while they drilled through this particular pressure ramp. Now, with temperatures around 350 degrees Fahrenheit, the actual bottom hole pressures were much lesser than calculated, and this is due to the thermal effects. MPD could <clears throat> help them compensate for the bottom hole pressure reduction by applying the necess necessary surface back pressures. Obtaining cores in an exploration well is one of the topmost priorities. They could retrieve three cores from this well without getting stuck. Now the value of the data they could get from studying the cores would surely benefit them for future development of the field. Let's, uh, now let's talk about the value that MPD brings for cementing operations. In most cases, the well cannot be handed over to completions if we cannot prove that there is a proper cement bond that isolates the producing formation. The governing bodies of the Gulf of Mexico, Europe, Asia, etc., and also land dictate a specific height for where the top of cement should be above the producing zone. This example is from offshore Gulf of Mexico, wherein the operator was spending roughly 25 days on an average performing remedial cement jobs. The remedial cement jobs could be tricky, in which you have to perforate and squeeze, hoping the cement fills the void above the producing zone. The, perfor the perforation guns are then milled before the next cement job is, uh, then the cement squeeze is done. And it could take a number of these squeeze jobs to prove the required top of cement before satis satisfying the criteria set by the governing bodies. So from a design standpoint, the frictional pressure loss estimation with a liner in the hole becomes challenging, especially with hole sizes 8.5 and, and lower. Also, the fact that there is no pressure gauge down the line of the casing to adjust the models to makes cementing calculations difficult in some cases. So the way MPD cementing works is by maintaining this, the highest bottom hole pressure below the known fracture gradients. This is how it works. So, so this is achieved by lowering the mud weights and managing the bottom hole pressures with MPD during a cement job. What we're essentially doing here is reducing the surface back pressure as the heavy column of cement rises in the analyst. With the MPD now, with MPD, um, now you can use heavy cement slurries with, with the ability to monitor any gain or loss during the entire cement job. Also, after the cement has been deployed in place, surface back pressure can be held until the cement sets or until the line top packet is set, which further increases the safety of the overall cementing operation. The utilization of MPD in deep water market has grown steadily, but increased quite some in offshore Gulf of Mexico in the recent years. We have been successful in delivering wells with margins as low as 150 PSI in some cases, with kickoffs very close to the mud line and with major risks to losing returns to the seabed. Even though rock stability before and after salt are crucial, stability of the salt was found to be one of the most important criteria to avoid stuck pipe events. Typically, due to the stresses and elastic properties of the salt, it tends to creep into the well boards, especially in high overburden areas. Adding surface back pressure actually was found to lower the risk and frequency of stuck pipe events in the salt. Now, speaking of salt exits, which is a big topic in itself, the formations below the salt diapirs tend to be fractured, or in technical terms, a rubble zone is sometimes encountered while exiting a salt dome. These fractured rubble zones are caused due to the stresses that the salt diapir exerts on the formations and due to the salt movement itself. Now, these fractures could potentially be a major loss zone or a major kick zone, depending on its connectivity, and surely is a potential for a major cause of NPT. The use of early kick loss detection and being able to manage the hormone pressures during salt exit have proven to be successful in the field. To give you a recent example, in 2019, one of the operators was able to save 38 days of the AFE time so that is 38 days of the critical path time while they used MPD on all of the six wells they're drilling off Mexico. 
One of the most significant savings while using MPD was from a pressure ramp, which gave them a 1.4 ppg kick, which they could control. In the offset wells, they could never recover from this pressure ramp drilling conventionally as the drilling margins became extremely small after the ramp. In this well, they could drill to TD with MPD and never had to pump kill mud weight. The pressure regression below a pressure ramp could be a recipe for its lost circulation and non-productive time. Since the operator did not lose in the pressure regression, they proved MPD could really help them manage bottom pressures and reach target depths. With this, let me hand it back to Anthony to discuss the financials, the business models, and future trends. Thank you, Arshad. So what you see in front of you is a table using some, some rough numbers over the course of the last 10 years. And again, they vary across the world considerably. But if we take the examples Harshad shared, and let's take land MPD days. In the Haynesville example, 14 days were saved. If we use a spread rate of a range from 30 to 65, that's roughly $420,000 to $910,000 that was saved of the 14-day savings. But let's think of the lost kick event. A lost kick event can be, you know, partly seven days, which you can see there are about half the numbers of previous I previously stated. And a stuck pipe event could have that same amount of effective cost, the number of days lost, and I add it to a BHA, which could be $1 million, and then those can be even more than that, plus other costs. To sum that up, anywhere from $400,000 to $900,000 could be spent, plus $1 million or even more to $5 million sometimes with BHAs, plus the mud. In the high-pressure temperature example Harsh had shared, they saved 1,100 barrels of mud, and that's a lot of expense. And again, as all of you know, there are other costs. But if you used NPD in that example for 19 days on those wells, you roughly spend somewhere between 5 and 20, depending if you're doing just a basic RCD rental up to the highest in systems of today around the world. You would have only spent, you know, from 100000 to almost $400,000, which is significantly lower than the cost of loss in the days MPD that were caused by these risk events. But let's go offshore. I'm oh, sorry. Let's go with the 50-day saved and high pressure high temperature example. 50 days is even more significant, making it almost $3 million at the high side of what you could lose and spend uh, or get back if you save those days. And, uh, and using MPD for the entire time period of the 33 days, you didn't spend nearly, you know, just over half a million dollars. Again, the, the cost for MPD dwarfs the, um, the impact and savings it provides, even on a land system. But when you go offshore, those numbers are even higher. So let's take the MPD event offshore. If we take seven-day event offshore, roughly I've heard from operators that a million dollar spread rates, a good number to use offshore. I've heard 30,000 an hour, I've heard 1.25 million. Let's just say it's a million. That's roughly $7 million of spread rate lost in the cost for a seven-day MPD event, uh, not including other costs that would be spent. But you could use MPD for a month, and roughly, again, offshore for the past uh, multiple years around the world, let's say it's about $1 million a month for the cost of MPD. You'd spend only $3 million. Well, let's take the other example, the 38 days that were saved in, a high pre in the deep water example. Again, that's $38 million. And again, MPD for a year would cost you about 12. But let's look at that the, another way around. If MPD cost $3 million, a little over $3 million, they would still break even at the $38 million savings. And $3 million a month for MPD is twice as much as I've ever heard MPD cost, even in the boom times. So for operators, the question really is, how are you estimating to spend your pain points? I mean, MPT and these pressure-related events that you're planning for and trying to avoid have a cost. How much are you putting in your estimates for that cost? And I'm going to talk about more of that in a, in a, in a second. But for the drilling contractor... You know, if I went to a drilling contractor and said, hey, I got this great technology, it can save you 14 days or 38 days in your, on your drilling plan, they look at me cross-eyed, because that means a direct impact to their revenue. But drilling contractors, you're very, in a very competitive state. You're, this MPD is a differentiator for your performance metric, days versus depth. <clears throat> so when you look at your operations and you're promoting yourself to operators, look at the wells you drill with MPD and look at those you drill without. And look at that as a differentiator for which, hey, you can save the operator a considerable amount of risk and money the use of the, of the MPD equipment. But let's talk about a few other results for a second that we don't, it's not as easy to quantify. Let's talk about safety. One of the things that major operator executive told me was that with MPD, you're always shut in. 
Now, shut in is kind of a sensitive word, and we all know what that means when you shut in with the BOP. But a BOP is really a system that provides back pressure. By closing a BOP, you're essentially putting back pressure, full back pressure on a well. And a BOP has two states, either open or closed. But MBD is actually provides open and closed and all the levels in between, as we've talked about, and you continue drilling. And at the same time, you still have the safety equipment. So MBD is actually doing even more advanced performance that a BOP can do, and you're always shut in and able to immensely respond to well control situations. And I ask this question to you as an industry. Are you more safe when you use your safety equipment or when you don't need to? You know, I really find it astounding when I joined uh, when I joined the oil field and 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 um, the amount of and compared to all my military experience and consider safety equipment, the amount of times we test and the amount of times we operate the BOP is astounding. I mean, I can't imagine. I don't think of another safety equipment in the world where where we we accept using it that much. If if there was the airbags in your car and we were testing them every week and every six months we were using the airbags in our car, I think we all would save say we need to find a safe way to drive. Well, let's talk about something else, some about smaller volumes, as Harsh had mentioned. An influx with MBD can be very small, let's say five barrels or less. In fact, we've had many examples where it's just in gallons. But in conventionally, you can have barrel, you can have kicks and have greater than 25 barrels of influx, and that's really pressure related. It's all about kick intensity and the differential pressure when you're drilling. You know, when you think about your drilling with and conventionally, when you have an influx, essentially what you were doing is you're drilling unbalanced. You just didn't know it, and you get a pretty significant influx. And the safety of that of having a small influx versus a very large one, it should be obvious to all of us. But let's talk about the losses. We, we all know that's a risk and that's a cost, but, but there's an interesting story. One of our customers in the Middle East, we save them 145 truckloads of mud, and, of course, they're happy about the, the, the mud savings, but what they really have about was the logistics savings. They didn't have to plan and coordinate and organize the delivery of 145 truckloads. Now, you don't think of MBD as a logistics necessarily savings, but when you, when you don't have these pressure-related events, the secondary and tertiary costs you spend on these, on these uh, pressure-related MPT times are also saved. And then I, the last point on safety or in these smaller volumes is that it's really important and I know many companies have products for early kick detection. And no, that sounds very good. Let's have early kick detection. But as Harsh had described, a kick detection is then followed by analysis, followed by decision-making, steps made with the BOP systems, which takes minutes. But early kick response is really the, isn't that more important? And again, with an MPD system, you're responding in milliseconds. And early kick response is actually the, the item that makes us safer. And let's talk about production increases. Again, I've had, I've had people tell me in the field that MBD doesn't do anything for production increases, but let's go through these examples. <clears throat> Formation damage and, and was one of the items mentioned in the questionnaire that many people answered they were concerned about. And essentially, formation damage comes from an overbalanced situation, which causes skin damage, which only can affect production. But even more so, uh, as, as many of you know from experience, that losses in a reservoir are huge issues and take considerable remediation to, to, to reduce that effect, and ultimately that definitely has an kinetic effect on the production levels. In fact, across the world, we've done MPD for workover wells. And in those cases, we, can, we worked over wells with MPD that were formerly drilled, obviously, and we got more production after the workover than they had initially when they drilled the well conventionally. And so there's significant evidence that MPD also affects the production increases. Well, let's talk about how we budget and plan. So, all companies, most oil companies, as I understand it, have a probabilistic AFE model. When they look at all their wells and how much they're spending, there's some P50, which, which amounts, and I've heard them, them say that that's roughly 20% NPT. But the P25, they, the P25, the, the lower budget they'd like to achieve, would probably require about 5% NPT. Now, my first question is, are we budgeting for P25 or are we planning for P25? You know, we're all stressed with, with budgets, especially now with this oil price, oil price crash that we're experiencing, is that you can't just budget for P25 and expect to achieve it. You have to plan for it. You know, and how do you plan for it is that, is that you have to find a way to reduce that MPT time. And MPT actually reduces the probability of pressure-related MPT, as Harshad showed. 
And it's really one of the hardest things to understand as human beings is probability. And it's really probable versus plausible. And let me explain. We all know it's, it's good for us to eat healthy and to drive safely. Uh, but your likelihood of passing away from a heart attack is one in three. Uh, but the likelihood of having a fatal car accident is one in a hundred. You know, both are plausible, but the stress you have eating a hamburger probably isn't nearly the stress you have driving to work every day. But one is certainly more probable than the other. But let's go to companies, what companies need to do for drilling contractors and operators is look at the MPT time you have when you drill with MPD or conventionally. What is your P50 MPT? And remember the example from the high pressurized temperature. In that example, 35% MPT time was reduced to 4.3. That, that reduction obviously happened in have reduced day, number of days drilling and that number as significant cost savings. So let's look around the world for a second. Look around the world. These are all the places that we know that MPD is being used. It's pretty significant, as you can see. And what we see around the world is the utilization rate anywhere from 5 to 75 percent. Of course, some are zero. But in the U.S., in historic numbers, roughly 75 percent of, of drilling was happening with at least an RCD of some form of, of managed pressure drilling. And around the world, we see in places it's, it's 5 percent, and we see it growing and more in, in various places. But obviously, the U.S. is not an isolated place. MPD can be used in a lot more wells than it's currently being used. And what we're seeing is the adoption rate increase. We're seeing those that haven't used it before, and as we show and explain these examples, they are starting to use MPD more. And even more interesting is we're seeing geocentric tipping points, where those who have used it are seeing this benefit, and they're starting to go from just using it to make it a standard process. And let's look at how that's how it's happening offshore. So this is the MPD rig integration for the last, so from 2013. As you can see, there's the number of deep water rigs that were you know, operating. And on the bottom, you're seeing the number of MPD kits that were in service, and those that are rentals and those that are owned by operators. So last year, 2019, we reached 13% of the industry, and we think that'll grow to 16. But if you look at that curve, that is a 30% growth rate, and that's pretty significant, and that has completely different than it has to do with the number of rigs being used. You know, World Oil just in their webcast a few weeks ago shared that they think the, the offshore industry will go 4.7%. Again, all of us are in speculation of how that's going to happen now with this price war. But MPD is obviously operating in a different curve than what the industry is, is just normal drilling operations. And there's a reason for that. So the reason is that offshore operators are tendering a higher percentage of rigs needing MPD. At some time in the past, that was zero. Uh, it was 30 a few years ago. And, and, and drilling contractors have shared with me that it's somewhere between 50 and 60 percent last year. So let's pose this question. If there's 200 plus rigs remaining in the offshore industry drilling MPD, it'll take eight years at 30 percent growth until all of them have an MPD system. So my question is, how many years is it going to take if, if there are 100 percent of tenders require rigs with MPD? It requires significant faster, but that also requires significant growth in the industry. And let me use an example as, as some of the industry still would like the, the, the model still be the old way, that still have a rental fleet. And let's talk about how that's just unsustainable. To have two more hundred rental systems in the world, if Weatherford have half, half of those, that's a hundred riser systems. That's well over 10 billion in CapEx. It's an astronomical amount of CapEx. And it would, they would need, we would need another 1,000 personnel. That's more than all the personnel doing MPD across the world right now. And the industry, as many of you know, is challenged to grow at 30% with MPD. So it's just unthinkable and it's really unattainable for us to continue in the rental model. And what's happening today is a natural consequence for us to achieve the results of MPD that operators know uh, in the old models we have. And I'll talk about those in a little bit. Let's talk about some history, though. Um, in the past, the service required through rig contractors was very small. It was just a drilling rig. <clears throat> I was wondering if anybody on the call was on the was in this picture, and I know some of you MPD folks are, have been around a long time, so uh, I, I'm just teasing actually. But if you think about the fact that MPD was first introduced in 1968, this technology is over 50 years old. It's not new. It's been around a long time, and it has pro it has proven results. But today, what's happening is that service required through rig contractors. Um, is extensive, a number of different products and services. Now, for the operator, 
this certainly makes sense, and it makes sense for all of us, many of us are doing this in the industry, is, is let's put as many product and resources through a single procurement chain. It makes less procurement exercises. It's simpler. It causes, ha, requires less procurement personnel, so it makes sense. And the operators are benefiting from that strategically because the rig, con, rig rates and rigs are so competitive, and so very competitive, and that's causing, um, again, they're getting some price benefit. But for the drilling contractor, they're taking on additional risks because often they're unfamiliar with the cost and the prices and technology which they're being asked to provide. Um, and the thing important to remember about risk is that it's not a zero-sum game. Now, for those who don't know what a zero-sum game is, it's like chess or checkers. For somebody to win, somebody loses. But risk isn't like that. You pass risk down to the supply chain, it still exists. And those risks exist and come back to you in the form of maybe lower quality products or technology, maybe poor understanding performance of operating those, those products. And again, unhealthy, unhealthy price in, in markets and management of those costs can result in unhealthy companies. You know, for the rig contractor, this also though is a, with risk there's opportunity. And for the rig contractor, this brings about a competitive advantage. For rig contractors who understand these technologies, um, perform them very well, can show that competitive difference of their, their days, days per depth and their performance in NPT, can use that as an advantage in the, in the market because it's very competitive. So let's talk about the models that we shared and mentioned earlier. So the rental model that's been there for a while, a drilling, an operator would, would, would hire a drilling contractor, they hire a service company for some of those services shown, and then of course that service is going to mobilize and execute on the rig, and that's the historic model, which Again, as far as MBD concerns, just can't continue. Um, but today we have the rig tender model. And what's kind of happening is operators are tendering to the rig contractor and then going to these service companies for either rental or capital sales based on what the products are. And what we're seeing in the market is that the rig contractors haven't really received that uh, financial benefit in their, in their rig rates. And again, it, it's really not sustainable either. Uh, you can't continue to, to spy, spend money and not receive money and become healthy. And I think we already know through the crash that we're uh, in a tenuous situation right now in the industry, and certainly this price war, price war doesn't make it any better. You know, an important topic for all of us is the total cost of ownership. And with that, I ask you, whose total cost of ownership? Certainly the total cost of ownership of the operator needs to be effective, and they need to see value of these technologies and, and operate and, and can really improve. But they also, we need total cost of ownership of the drilling contractor to, to be valid, and that they can continue to affect reform and improve and, and continue on and again, that's the same with the service company. You know, what we really need in the industry is more alignment, where the operators really look at the drilling contractors as performance partners, and the drilling contractors look at their service company as performance partners. And by aligning the performance we want to achieve with the technology we have, we'll get what everybody needs, and we'll have a more effective industry. You know, in 2018, the MPD UBD conference was sharing that they were still searching for the right model. And I would say today that the industry is still searching. Let's talk about some trends, and what I'm going to do is talk about trends, but talk about the value challenge. Sometimes these trends all sound positive and exciting, but there's value challenges with it, and I want to share some of those. So let's talk about the first one, the red zone reduction. Again, for those who may not be familiar with the red zone reduction, we want to reduce the personnel in the moon pool in the drilling area, because that's a very a high risk area for injuries, and the more we reduce that, the safer we are as an industry. But the problem with that is priceless means free. And you're wondering what I mean by that. So let's pretend for a second that I have a web app. And the web app absolutely is proven to make your kids safer. It absolutely is. You're sure of it. We're sure of it. And we're offering this web app for sale. Should it be $10? But we're talking about your kid's safety here. Maybe it's $100. Again, this, this, this is a proven technology to reduce risk, which if it would happen to you would be significant catastrophic risk and your children are priceless. Maybe it's a thousand dollars. But what you're thinking in your head is, Anthony, didn't you say this was a this was an app for an iPhone or an Android? I mean, they're free. Can't you make the money on this via advertising or, or data collection? And that's the problem, is that people have a trouble. We have a trouble pricing things that are safety. We want to be safe, but we don't understand how to buy safe. And what we do is compare that price to other things that have nothing to do with safety, just other apps on your phone. And we're doing that a little bit with NPD as well, is that the, the benefit and the safety in, that, are, that we're showing here isn't being realized in the value and, uh, and the value of also the new technology that's coming to market. And again, there's a reason that 
or governments around the world make safety mandatory, car seats and seat belts and safety equipment. Because again, we have that trouble understanding that, you know, do I spend $150 on a car seat or I spend a, you know, you know, a few more thousand dollars on a safety equipment um, is because we tend, not to, we tend not to make that choice. But it's a choice we need to make as leaders and we have to remind ourselves how important it is to be safe and to and invest in safety. Let's talk about integration automation. Again, there's been many advances in the industry brought in MPD and as, many, as other technologies as well. But I was talking to an operator about a portion of this technology and they were stressing that there wasn't a standard for something and so, so they really need to have a standard. And I was totally in agreement with that, but the point I made back was you can have the standard all you want, but if you don't specify it, then you're not going to get it. You're going to get whatever can be offered. And then again, if the, if the companies that are offering that standard and the higher quality or higher automation and the higher integration aren't winning the tender, then you're not going to get it either and there's no value. So there's really no value in integration automation advancing products unless they're specified, unless the, the, the person winning the tender, winning the work actually you know, wins the work. Let's talk about consolidation and, and commoditization. Certainly there's been a lot of industry consolidation since the crash. Again, that's often provides more offerings. Companies come together, have more products, have more offerings, can buy, combine and integrate more things, and it's very positive. But it also causes less competition. And as you commoditize products, what you see is that that and let's take let's take pins for example. You have a thousand you can go to a store and find a thousand pins, and they're no different. When you commoditize a product, then it becomes stifles technology innovation. We're kind of seeing that with some of, some of this in the transition we're making in the, in the MPD industry is the risk of stifling, the, the stifling technology innovation. Again, and what's, what has to happen in the future is, again, to, to change that would mean business models that actually change, change such as Dollar Shave Club and Uber. The business model will have to change even further to continue those in, improvements in, in, in automation and in integration. Let's talk about low car footprint. We all like that. Certainly, I just try to struggle sometimes if somebody could tell me what a carbon atom is worth. You know, I think I mentioned that story about 145 truckloads. And again, the 145 truckloads of, of mud means uh, came meant less losses, which is also an environmental impact of having to produce less mud and the chemicals and materials to use. But also the fact that less truckloads has an environmental impact of less of less time and vehicles on the road emitting, car emitting carbon. And again, less MBT and more efficiency means, again, less time we're producing and, and producing carbon in various operations. So it certainly is less carbon footprint, but I know that we have a hard time imagining MPD uh, is a lower co lowers our carbon footprint, but it really does. And let's talk about the last one, digitalization. Again, data is data's so important in digitalization but it's, let's realize there's no value without the data. We didn't have a digitalization strategy or an opportunity in the 17th century. We just have it now because of the 20th century. But there's also no value in the data itself. Unless you take the data, do analytics, and make something of it, there's no value in the data. So you have to invest in the data to get that. Again, there's a tremendous amount of data that's provided in MPD when you, when you drill through wells and understand the formations and, 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 and find out those uncertainties before, before it's too late. So again, if you're thinking about drilling 10 wells, how about drill the first three with MPD, get a good idea and benchmark of what MBT you could have and the risks that are there, and then decide how to plan the rest of the wells. Too often, like the example shown, half the wells are drilled and they have incredible problems and then they bring in, bring in MPD. And certainly around the world, we've had instances all the time where a customer calls us to provide an MP, MPD and they're already shut in. They already had a kick, they're shut in and they're stuck and now they wanna know how we can help them. It's a little too late because MPD is a risk reducer and could have prevented that in the first place, and it's kind of hard to do it after the fact. So some closing thoughts. Again, really what we're talking about is handling uncertainty. I think what we've done here hopefully is demystifying MPD. And, um, you know, somebody, somebody, I've heard people say that MPD is a science project. You know, Weatherford has done 3,467 jobs this year alone, uh, all the way from RCD rentals to MPD systems around the world. And that's just this year. If you, take, if you take everybody in the world, that's probably twice as much. If you go back 10 years, that's 100,000 some jobs, again, 100,000 some wells that have used MPD. This is a fully capable technology that's fully being utilized around the world as I showed earlier. And I want to encourage you not to let the status quo receive a free pass. I kind of got that wording from my time with Six Sigma and then my 
in the Navy, we use a, a risk tool called operational risk management. And in both of those, what we realize is you look at something new and you think there's risk. Oh, it's risk for different. It's going to be this, this, and this. But you have to realize there's no zero risk. You are currently have a risk profile. How you do things today, however that is, whatever procedures you have, have a risk profile. And so what is that risk profile? Because the change may actually be less risk. In fact, I like one of the major uh, senior executives and an operator said that what he's had his team do is they help develop a number of technologies for the industry with suppliers, is that they have their team now prove you shouldn't use the new technology. Prove you shouldn't use it. Prove that if you didn't use it, you could get the same result. And I guess I ask you, prove that you can get 5% NPT without managed pressure drilling. Can you get 5% NPT? I'd like to see you prove that, and that will help you also look at it and realize what are you getting today. And let's talk last about sustainability. Again, whether we're talking about the environment or supply chain, we all kind of realize if you take more than you can re replenish, you can irreparably damage the environment in the same way you can irreparably damage the capability, the innovation, the technology in our industry. And we have to make value for everyone. We have to be able to put back in the system what we're taking out, and that will effectively allow our technology to grow and continue to grow in the future. And with that, I just thank you. Thank all of you. We are humbled to serve our customers and industry. Again, please reach out to anyone at Weatherford if we can, do we can, so we can hear you, how, so we can hear you and, and ask how we can serve you more. And with that, we're going to open it for questions. Thanks, Anthony. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of our webcast. You can continue to submit your questions in the Q and A box located on the bottom left corner of your screen. Now, let's get started with our first question. What MPD method is in the presentation based on? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Harshad, do you understand what that is? Skip to is? the next one. Mm, let's see here. MPD. Okay, here we go. MPD is continuous well control but the BOP is still available for use when and if needed. It will also be tested frequently every 21 days. Do you think regulators will extend the time between BOP tests for deep water wells once they figure out that MPD replaces the portion of the duty of a conventional BOP? Do you anticipate that regulators would ever require MPD on all deep water wells as a significant kick prevention management tool? Yeah, let's let's kind of look at it this way, and I I like the analogy of using um, your brakes. So your brakes on a car um, are a pressure control device. By applying pressure to the to a pad and a drum, it reduces your speed. It's a speed control device. So what is an analog brake system? An analog brake system is a control system that gives you optimum brake performance. It could adjust that pressure faster and more accurately than a human ever could to give you optimum braking. Analog brakes is a control system. Your brakes is still a safety system. The, the, the emergency brake is still a safety system. So MPD doesn't eliminate or, or any way say that we shouldn't have safety systems, but it's a control system that as you get more control and you seem to have less incidents and you, and you perform better, can the safety equipment be tested differently or can it, can it be operated differently? Well, that's certainly something that could be considered. But I think I do kind of imply in the earlier part of the slide that, that again, if we really care about safety and we sh have shown proven safety benefits of uh, a child car seat or that NPD can reduce risk, then I think at some point regulators have to really think about why isn't this mandatory if it's, if it's proven to be safer. Good deal. Next question is what are the precautions required for planning MPD? Well, I don't think that um, there are there there are a couple of things that that you need to take to take into account when you plan MPD. Of course, the limitations of the MPD system itself, like you know, the RCD has a a pressure limitation. The the shoe strength is a pressure limitation. The um, uh, uh, the rig itself, sometimes if it's land, could be a limiting factor based on 
the height of uh, the, the rig floor to the BOP, and you have to fit the RCD in there. So, so there's, there are quite a few things that, that go into designing uh, an MPD package correctly for, for the given well, right? And like I, like I suggested in my, pre, in my, my slides and presentation, you know, it has to be an engineered approach. You have to look at it um, uh, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a broader view before you actually go into just, just utilizing it. Good deal. Next question. Why would anyone drilling offshore not drill everything with MPD to reduce consumption of drilling fluid, chemicals, and weight material? Again, I, I think what you're seeing offshore by the, by the stats I showed is that, that operators are seeing it more and more as a tool. And I think, I think they're seeing it more, again, as a, as a risk prevention. Again, the probability of these of, of, of un, it's an uncertainty and an unforeseen well control situation. Again, certainly they're seeing savings in mud. They're seeing, in one example, I know the operator saved two casing strings in designing well, and that's hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings. So I think operators are seeing it as a, as a business in that it reduces their risk, it makes them more productive, and they're finding many ways to save money and recoup that investment. Um, uh, I think that's where, where we're seeing it today. Good deal. Next question. What percentage of your current business is based on a performance contract model? So I'm, I want to make sure I clarify that is because sometimes we think of a performance contract model of, hey, you perform this, you get certain bonuses, you get certain percentages of something, and, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm not going that far. Again, certainly industry could go that way, and it's been talked about for years, but what I'm talking about is are you choosing the higher performance company to do your work? Are you really basing your choice on performance and understanding that performance includes the type of equipment, the safety of equipment, the performance of the, of the suppliers? Are you looking at performance alignment and understanding that, again, when you want higher performance, you're, gonna, you're investing in a, in a higher performance car, you're going to pay a little more for a higher performance car. Uh, are we looking at our, our procurement that way, that, is, that we need to drive for performance and not just drive for you know, a lower budget? Next question, what is the most important critical component in the MPD spread? Critical component um, in the MPD spread, okay, fair enough. Depends on if you're, if you're talking about offshore or land, right? Uh, you definitely cannot do MPD without an RCD, and you need a choke to actually put back pressure on it. Then you need a Coriolis meter. To, to find out what your uh, flow out is, to, you know, to, that enhances your whole understanding of, of how you're reading the well. Now, in, in a lot of cases, um, you know, we call it poor boy MPD, they don't use Coriolises on land, which, you know, which could be one of, one of the cases, but you definitely need an RCD, you need floats in the drill string, and you need a choke, uh, and you need the piping that connects all of that. Um, I guess, I guess in, a, in a short notice, that's the best answer I can give. Good deal. Next question, what is the daily cost of running MPD offshore? <laughs> Again, I, I think that earlier, just using a range um, of a million dollars a month, I think that works out to $33,000 a day or something like that. Again, it can range, even that can range up and down. Again, it's a matter of also the personnel, the more personnel used. Uh, and again, do you want engineers on there full time or just one? So I think it varies, uh, but I think that average I used in the slide was was again a reasonable average for around the world, uh, both today and in the past you know past ten years. Next question: Do you see a trend of MPD drilling spread to onshore shale drilling? Um, it's interesting you ask the trend state. We're already using an onshore shale drilling. It's already being used extensively. Again. Uh, when I say the fact that, that, again, from data we've collected in the past and in, in, in near term, that 75% of, of U.S. drilling uh, used an RCD or some form of MPD, uh, that covers a lot of the drilling happening in the, in the shell drilling today. So, um, again, it may not seem obvious to everybody that, you know, again, when you're trying to drill wells um, that require fracking and don't want to flow, but uh, essentially, again, you're still dealing in a situation where you have unknown pressures, unknown um, 
carbonates. You can have losses. So uh, again, I think just realize that no matter what area you're drilling, you're drilling into uncertainty. Next question, is there a way to make MPD economical on a single deep water wildcat well on a rig which is not MPD ready? Uh, read the question again because I think the first part didn't make sense of the last part. Is there a way to make MPD economical on a single deep water wildcat well on a rig which is not MPD ready? Uh, again, I, I, an M, a rig that's not MPD ready can't use MPD, so it has to, again, either buy a system or rent a system if it's available. But again, by a wildcat well, I think you mean more exploratory drilling. And the point is, we see the biggest value of MPD for exploratory drilling because you're dealing with the most unknowns. But again, once you get to development wells, again, most of our work is, is probably in the development wells. But the point is, even once you're going to do multiple wells in a field and you realize some of the risks there and there's still uncertainty is when, when companies are more willing to invest in, in MPD. And again, that's why we're seeing the growth, I think, in the Gulf of Mexico and other places offshore is that if they're going to drill in these environments, they're realizing MPD has a distinct value and, and um, risk reduction and cost savings. Next question, is the operation controlled by rig crew and who decides what pressure is needed? Yeah. So, um, so, so, well, let me put it this way. Um, we have trained uh, um, a few of the operators, especially in the deep water, um, to understand what uh, pressures are required. But at the end of the day, um, uh, depending on depending on the uh, expertise of the driller or of the operators on the drill ship, uh, uh, the trainings and, and their education might, you know, there may be there may be a, a lag in in getting in getting to that phase. Nonetheless, uh, we are uh, planning for actually uh, training the drillers to understand what and how uh, they can they can you know they 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 can put pressure on the well or, or manage the bottom of pressures correctly. Now, there, there are quite, quite a few layers to that, um, uh, depending on if the drillers, is, if the recruit is land or, or offshore, right? And, um, uh, we, you know, and, and depending on which kind of software they use, there are different tiers of our, of our software too. Um, so that's, I, I think that's, that's where I'll stop. Let me, let me add to what Harshad is saying in that Again, this is a good a good question that MPD isn't installing equipment offshore and setting a and setting a pressure. MPD is is, is the best MPD is when you plan and design the well for MPD, and you plan and design with your best understanding of the well and you and you 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 implement that plan. And again, just like conventional drilling, there's many things that you find different than your plan. But again, that's one of the benefits of the MPD system; it can react to that. So there are systems out there in the world that just provide a, a single set point and they drill with one pressure until they want to change it. And again, I think whoever's setting that set point or whoever's designing the well needs to be qualified engineering. And again, to be, to be fair to the drilling contractor, they've been placed in some odd yeah. situations where they're saying they provide an MPD, but the operators assume that they're going to provide MPD engineering, which isn't really their skill set. And they don't get that just because they buy equipment. So I think we still need to rely on the industry from, from organizations, Weatherford and there are others, who are very experienced in MPD engineering and planning wells with MPD. They still have that service, and that's still something that belongs to those, to those, in, those companies because they have that expertise. Um, you just can't get that expertise because you buy a system and you know, how to know, where to, know which buttons to press. Is MPD being used to simplify well designs in deep water, making them less telescopic, meaning fewer strings to get to the MPD? Uh, well, absolutely, they are. Um, one of the things, one of the things that, that MPD does affect, uh, which is, you know, people are still looking at it, they're still understanding it, they're still trying to figure it out, is it does reduce. Um, you know, if, if you talk of kick tolerance and if you talk of uh, the hazards that are you going through, it does it does reduce one the kick tolerance by reducing the the influx size, 
um, uh, which can reduce, which can potentially reduce the number of strings. But in, most importantly, um, you know, casing strings are put to mitigate drilling hazards. Uh, you know, some, sometimes they're contingency liners, sometimes those are in, in the plan. Uh, just because there are pressure ramps, just, just because there are pressure regressions. And all the examples we went through, um, they kind of prove that um, MPD is a tool that could potentially reduce the number of strings in the well. And we've seen examples, and I think I mentioned the, the offshore well that, that eliminate two casing strings. And again, what's interesting in MPD is I could be in a meeting with a customer and, and that we could say we could reduce casing strings, and they completely don't believe, me, believe us. Um, but we've done it. We've done it offshore. We certainly do it on land. And I think I like the way Harsh had said that. Um, casing strings are there to manage risk. Right. If you can manage the risk some other way, then you don't need as many casing strings. It, it all depends on the well. It all depends on what, how the well is planned. So. Next question. What is your approach on flat time improvements applying MPD? Well, it depends on what the flat time is, right? Um, if the flat time is about... Um, uh, top drive, then, then of course MPD cannot help. But in terms of pressure-related events or drilling hazards related to pressure, pressure um, in the well or you know um, major kick events, loss events, ballooning events, you know MPD does help a lot. Uh, it does help reduce those flat times, and it does help reduce the side tracks mainly. Um, yep. Thanks, Arshad. That's all we got time for today. We would like to thank you all for attending today's webcast. We would also like to thank Weatherford for producing this timely and informative presentation. Finally, an on-demand version of this webcast will be made available in the coming days and will be emailed to everyone. This concludes our presentation.